my story begins with not a cliffhanger, but a boat hanger. Um, so when I was two years old, we were initially trying to move southward from Da Nang to Saigon, and then Saigon was the uh, path out of Vietnam. And in that moment, we were on a small boat and we pulled up to a freighter. Um, so there's a huge difference in size, multiple stories. Um, and what would happen is you would have to wait until the waves lifted the smaller boat up and there would be a single thick docking line that sent down and each individual had to jump, catch on it, and then climb up the rest of the way. Well, my family, you can imagine, I'm two years old, I'm not gonna be able to do it by myself. At that point, my mother was planning to abort the trip and a man next to her said, throw me the, you know, give the baby to me and I'll throw, throw her to the deck. And she said no, but at that moment, my sister who was 13 years old at the time had already leapt. Caught on, the, caught on the rope, climbed up herself. So, she, you know, we didn't want to be split up. So at that point, my mother turned to the stranger and said, okay, go ahead, and handed me over to, um, to him. He then threw me, waited for the boat to be lifted by another wave, threw me to the deck above to yet another stranger who caught me by one chubby little hand. And we miraculously all survived. And I'll never forget that my brother describes these different escapes once you get onto the boat to see a sea of floating black pants, which is what women in my tradition wore. And floating pants, of course, means that people unfortunately didn't make the jump. And at the time, my brother describes it as which means that a life of a single person is not does not have the worth of a single red penny. And then from the barge to the Seventh Fleet, which took us to the Philippines in Subic, uh, Subic Bay in the Philippines. From the Philippines, we go to Guam, and that's where the tent cities were set up. The tent cities at, at one point maxed out at 50,000 people and between the at, at the when we left the barge my uh, brother was not allowed to come with us so any any um, any males over the age of 16 were not allowed to come it was women children um, elderly so my brother was left behind what was really remarkable was when we got to Guam you can imagine the devastation that my parents must have felt that they broke a promise to my father's parents, um, my mother's parents. She didn't even get to see them before we left. And then now they lost their oldest son somewhere amongst all the refugees. We get to Guam and remarkably, my, uh, my brother happened to see my father in the middle of the streets and we were reunited. Um, so we had so many moments that were harrowing, that were difficult, but there were so many other things where we, uh, that we, you know, we have gratitude for. If you ask each family member, everyone has a different perspective and a different memory. Um, my parents obviously felt we're very uh, conscious about, you know, how do we how do we survive in this new country with a new language? My younger siblings remember standing in queue for hours for food, um, excited um, with this large community. My oldest sister remembers um, in we were housed in these barracks, these army barracks, and each barrack has maybe twenty families in it, and uh, she remembers being upstairs looking at the window, staring at the boy across the way um, in the other barrack that was staring back at her. And uh, they have been together for 45 years and counting at this point. We ended up migrating a, a, 
a couple times within the U.S. and ended up in Louisiana. I grew up with black and white teachers, black and white friends, in a community of Asians. So I had the privilege actually of growing up with a lot of diversity and a lot of perspective. And I also happened to end up in schools where talent mattered. And it's one of those things where you don't appreciate the prejudices that people have or don't have until you lose it and you move into another environment where it's extremely prevalent. And it's quite shocking. Um, it's quite shocking, really disappointing, but it teaches you how to adjust and it teaches you how to be really scrappy and, uh, and stand for your values. When I went to this new school, um, I was definitely the only Asian person at this moment. And in the mornings, I would be on a swing set and I would, I was definitely shunned. So I would try to occupy my time by just being on the swing set. And inevitably, I would get pushed off every morning. Just, it was, it just sucked. But you know, you brush yourself off and you uh, find another corner to sit in. Um, and then in the afternoons, I would wait by the curb and boys would bike by and sometimes they would spit on me and sometimes they would just yell names and that was just life until one day seven girls decided to surround me and um, they decided they were going to beat me up for no apparent reason. At this point I decided to use their prejudices against them and I'd watched enough Bruce Lee movies to know what a good horse dance looks like and to know how to ground my body, how to raise my hands to, you know, at least fake it. Well, just having that confidence uh, was enough because I broke out of a stereotype. I, I, went, I leaned into a stereotype and broke out of it at the same time, meaning um, I leaned into the, you know, all chinks, no kung fu but also I broke out of the meek Asian girl model. And so half of them went away automatically and the other half, let's just say, I walked out just fine. There were no teachers around and I was never bothered again the rest of the school year. Meritocracy worked for me for a while. I did very, very well early in career. And what I would find is towards middle career, when you're starting to move up, that's when meritocracy starts falling apart and people like me are stubborn and I refused to see that I refused to admit it because success was merely an equation of intelligence and diligence if I'm not um, ascending in the way that I've always ascended I must be doing something wrong I had to realize that there were other factors and I did what I could to network um, to expand and stretch, but there were there were elements that I just had to realize that I was fighting 200 years of unconscious bias, and I had to stand up for myself, um, and I had to find advocates and allies to stand up for me. It was a big learning lesson, and it's made a really, really big difference. So the, my first experience would be when I left a long-time job, and I, what happens, when you leave corporate and become an entrepreneurial, you really get to figure out who your friends are. And you really get to figure out who's gonna put their necks on the line for you. And remarkably, who doesn't? I received recommendations from people I never expected. And it was people that I had done favors for and or um, had conversations with, with never any intent of quote unquote, using them as a, as a network. But it just goes to show you that everyone's watching all the time. And if you come in with a good heart, with good intentions, it will lead the way. And because of these connections, I was able to replace my salary within the first 18 months, which is pretty astonishing for an entrepreneur. I just became really credible at, for what I do, known as an industry expert, specifically in sales enablement. Lo and behold, I've had 
a lot of recruitment from one company to another, from people who were just advocates. Hey, I spent I spent a day with this person. As soon as a job opening came up that was uh, interesting, they would think of me and say, I'm not the right fit for the job, but man, can I tell you someone who's really interesting? And uh, they laid their reputations down for me. And I really, really appreciate that. I know I can always walk through the fire and typically emerge better. So all I control, I cannot control other people. I cannot control their thoughts, behaviors, intents, and actions. So if I go in with authenticity, vulnerability, the best of intentions to help the other side, what's interesting is it actually opens up the same in the other person. They want to receive that. We forget how lucky we are. And I would say that is the thing that irritates me the most is when people don't use their voice and their choice. The phrase we use all the time in our household is first world problems. When you're feeling down, you know, you think about what you have and what others don't. You really are working in the framework of first world problems. We always let gratitude guide our attitude. We treat everyone um, with respect because there's an opportunity to learn. I learn from my children every day. My children um, at this point are my peers. They know that the weight of their message carries as much as mine. They're also very aware because of the, they know the stories in my background that ownership and accountability is really important, especially in sales, but true in life. Credibility is hard to earn easy to lose, and even harder to recover, if ever.